ready to get going. Yes, yes. I guess so. <laughs> All right. I, kn I know it's probably later where you are, so we'll try to move this, move this ship along, even though it is a big ship. And that's what this talk is about. Moving really, really big ships. Uh, so introduction, uh, we have not met before. My name is Dietrich Ayala. I um, work on IPFS, uh, Protocol Labs. I've been at Protocol Labs for uh, a couple of years now. And I got to meet some of you in the Birdie community at IPFS camp, which was very, very nice. Hopefully someday we will meet again in real life. But before joining Protocol Labs, I worked at Mozilla for over a decade on Firefox, Firefox OS. And I ran a number of uh, developer relations strategies there, uh, worked on projects like MDN and uh, the web extensions APIs at the time, uh, and a project called LibDWeb, which is about adding APIs to browsers, which allow you to build distributed protocols and projects uh, at the time. Uh, we weren't able to land those features inside Firefox. Uh, there was not a lot of interest, but uh, we're hoping that, that things change. And this talk is a little about, bit about changing the web as a whole to be more friendly for these technologies and to upgrade the web to have some of the characteristics of technologies that we think are important in empowering end users. Uh, distributed protocols, blockchains, peer-to-peer -peer technologies, cryptocurrencies, uh, cryptographic wallets, things like this. Some of the core technologies that Bertie itself has built up. Uh, so my work primarily has been around IPFS and I'm gonna talk about IPFS and the work we do with browsers and the web platform. Uh, the web platform is it's really big. There's a lot of browsers, a lot of players, a lot of API surface area. I think we counted uh, with working with some of the MDN team and, and there was around over 9,000 uh, individual API features of the web platform. So it's a massive, massive beast and uh, adding and removing things, even though it seems like things are being added, removed all the time, it's very difficult and can, can take a really long time. But kind of the core reason why uh, really speaks to some of the use cases of Birdie. So before we go into what we wanna change, it's really important to set and uh, the framing and ground ourselves in, in why we're doing it and why this work is important. And these are some of the things that, that I want to do on the internet. I want to be able to I want to be able to share a photo with somebody in the same room without having bytes leak out on to a third party server. And I want to be able to interact with a group in, in private and not have to worry about a company uh, having control over that or I want to know where where my all my stuff online is and be able to know that it'll always be there for me, even if the company disappears or the company gets bought by by Google or Facebook and shut down. Uh, I wanna make sure that I still have control over my stuff. So there's a bunch of these basic needs, but the HTTP web today doesn't quite meet these needs. Uh, some of these needs end up being translated into things that Juan Bennett, the inventor of IPFS and founder of Protocol Lab speaks about uh, in his Web3 values. These are values, but also, um, you know, the characteristics of, or, or you know, a, features of protocols and why why we work on some of these protocols because they enable these things or they imbue these values in them. But ultimately the challenge that we have today is that we have a very one-sided relationship with decision-making. On the HTTP web, the decision-making happens entirely on the server side instead of the user's side. So even though it's called a user agent, the decision-making power happens all entirely on the server. Let me check and make sure, am I still connected? Yes. Uh, so a little perspective, how, how big is this challenge? We wanna add some features to the web. How, how hard could it be? Um, the three, well, two major browsers and a whole bunch of minor browsers on, on the internet. Um, and unfortunately, the numbers tell a story that's more like this, where Chrome is basically 90% around of the browser market globally, according to StackCounter and uh, Safari is but 18% and basically every other percentage is so small that it is not a meaningfully important number. The 
the biggest number uh, are, I think it was Firefox and Edge both have a little over 3%. And that, that's the largest percentage aside from Chrome and Safari. Everything else is uh, one, one, I think uh, UC browser was around 1.2% and everything else was less than 1%, uh, which is a really dire story um, about uh, control of, of these two companies over the web as a whole. Rendering engines, you know, there's only three left now, really. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about more about that in a bit. But uh, again, this you know domination of Chromium-based browsers, WebKit, it, and, and Gecko being very, very tiny, tiny, tiny slice of overall rendering engines. Uh, WebKit it gets embedded in a lot of places, uh, appliances and things like that. So WebKit is not just Safari. It does have reach beyond that. And then Chromium, of course, has many, many browsers uh, that are built on it. Um, but these are factors that we take into account when we figure out what where we need to focus and, and make change. Uh, how about how about developers? Uh, there's actually an estimated 26 million developers on the planet right now. Uh, of those, ar around two thirds of them develop using web technologies, uh, or develop for the web, or around the web, or develop platforms that serve the web. Web three developers, very 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 small, probably you know like pro pro I, I I definitely estimate probably less than a hundred thousand. Uh, but it might even be radically smaller than that. I don't think there's good numbers on that right now. Uh, but I think when we're looking at who who we want to change, how we want, you know, the first, you know, web developers come to these platforms a lot, but really how do we change even much, much larger? How do we get to maybe our first million Web3 developers or P2P developers? How do we get to our first 5 million sort of major, major efforts that will take many years? Uh, but just giving some perspective on the size of, of the problem and, and the scope and of the of the, the size and scope of the landscape, that some of the decision making that happens uh, that does affect all 26 million developers or maybe all you know 15 million web developers about uh, is at these organizations, the W3C and the IETF. W3C is over over 300 companies, uh, but some of these are familiar names and a lot of them aren't important features on the web, things like CSS Grid, which really changed layout on the web, that was sponsored by Bloomberg, a news company, because they needed to be able to more easily lay things out on the web pages they're making, but also implemented by Egalia. So the people that are sometimes are making these changes on these massive platforms that do affect billions of people are names that either you've never heard of or names that uh, aren't unfamiliar and not really the names that you would typically think of. And this presents opportunities. Uh, these are 300 companies, seems like a lot, but ultimately that's a fairly small number of people that are making decisions. And ITF is actually open to anyone. You don't have to be a member. Over 1,200 people participate around in, the, in these recent, in the me recent meetings. And these are companies from all over the place, but there are some familiar, familiar names. Some of the leads of these groups are Apple and Facebook and Google employees, but there are also a bunch of other names and those are opportunities to affect change. And that's ultimately what our goal is as a challenger to HTTP, as a challenger to, you know, complementary, not to supplant it fully, but we do need choice and end users need more choices on the web and they need a web that, that does work for them in the worst circumstances, not just the best circumstances. So what we need is, you know, you'll hear this sometimes, we need a Cambrian explosion. We need to develop technologies that allow people to unlock application capabilities and, and they'll just start developing and it'll work so well that it'll just explode in new and different ways, uh, which would be nice, but is also something that doesn't happen by accident and it doesn't happen on its own and it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, the phrase you may have heard uh, from, from the movie, Fill the Dreams, is build it and they will come. And unfortunately, one thing that I've seen in many years of working with technology and working in, in developer relations specifically is just because you build it doesn't mean that they will come. So it's important to understand a few things about your audience. And we've been working with a group, Agalia, that I mentioned before, and I'll talk about them more about the work we're doing with them in this specific area. Uh, but Brian Cardell is a, uh, one of the leads at Agalia, and, and he gave a talk at the Browser 3000 Summit that really gave a view into how, how this change happens, the mechanics of how decisions are made, um, and about how browser vendors make decisions. And 
and it's very it's a great talk to watch and i highly recommend it it's uh, short uh, maybe 10 minutes and uh, it's a really good view from someone with really a lot of experience in understanding how and why decisions are made that really do affect billions of people in in the web platform uh so some of the lessons that we taken from these experiences so far is, is knowing the environment. If you want to affect a major change uh, in some of these spaces, understand who, who the decision makers are in these environments when, and how they work. Um, identifying what opportunities are to be able to work with those decision makers and, and pull on the levers of change. Uh, to, and to not let go, to make sure that you're always present and always participating in places where decisions are made, uh, but also to prepare for the unexpected. A lot of technology shifts that we've seen, major ones were not, uh, not meticulously planned or, or predicted, uh, or were predicted but not planned. And that means that we need to be aware of those as an opportunity uh, and, and also a threat. But here we're talking primarily about shaping environments so that we can take advantage of, of those opportunities. So we've distilled this down into three basic pillars in a strategy of first being on the web, make sure that the technologies that we are supporting are present on the web platform so that developers can choose them. Uh, this means we need to be implemented in web, in web browsers uh, in, this, in the case of IPFS. Uh, the second is, you know, thinking about that slide before, of how many people develop for the web uh, be awesomely available for, for JavaScript development. Um, not just, you know, hey, we have a client library or it kind of works or, you know, that you can connect to our stuff from JavaScript, but really have a first class experience for JavaScript developers. And the third is to ready be, be ready for some type of leapfrog event, uh, some type of watershed event where either the technologies are used in, in mass or a breakout product that really highlights these technologies uh, and uses them and brings a lot of attention to them uh, or the failure of an existing platform that allows a gap for new technologies to be able to step into. So I'm gonna, for the rest of this talk, really quickly walk through uh, these kind of three three pillars. The first and the major one that we've really invested in uh, is, is to be on the web. And this we've been doing for quite some time since I joined Protocol Labs, slowly pushing these, these efforts forward. Uh, we have the IPFS companion, and this is a way for us to be part of all web browsers. And this is very easy install. It's uh, available by, by default in Brave available for Chromium-based browsers and Firefox, and it allows a better IPFS experience in these browsers. But the extension space is closing, it's narrowing. There are fewer and fewer capabilities. Browsers are really locking down what you can do inside there. And a new uh, manifest V3 is being what's, is what it's called. It's being shipped out to browsers very soon, and it's gonna radically reduce the capability space of, of, of these extensions. So it's not really a long-term strategy for us. Uh, we've been working with Opera for uh, last couple of years, and they were the first browsers to ship IPFS protocol support. Not a native IPFS node, but the ability to address things directly using the IPFS scheme inside their browsers. You can now do this on uh, all major Opera browsers. Brave has been a partner for, for many years with IPFS, long before I even joined the IPFS project. And uh, this year was really significant in that we shipped a full IPFS node inside Brave Desktop with them. Uh, this is the first time that a major browser had uh, shipped an IPFS node where we both had the IPFS protocol support, but also uh, Brave, you know, will download IPFS, run the daemon, the daemon locally, and communicate it, communicate with it over IPC, proxying the requests that you make, and then rendering the content back in the browser. Uh, Brave's experiencing stratospheric growth right now, and that's a big opportunity for these types of technologies to get in front of more people. Uh, so it's been great to work with them. But Brave is built on top of Chromium. Chromium is the underlying open source browser code base that Chrome is built on and also many other browsers. So given the, you know, hearkening back to that earlier slide about how Chrome has 90% of the market right now and many of the other browsers uh, that are built on it um, are, uh, you know, we have an opportunity to, if we have support for IPFS and Chromium, to be able to uh, maybe lower the barriers for decision-making of those other browsers to adopt IPFS. And, you know, IPFS might be a differentiating feature for them. Uh, they might be able to differentiate themselves from Chrome if they have things like IPFS support. So adding IPFS support to Chromium, native IPFS support is something that was very, very high on the priority list for me this year. And we are working uh, with, with Agalia to do that. Agalia has done previous work uh, with us and we've been partnering for the last, you know, maybe year, year and a half uh, on a number of changes. Uh, we got a bunch of, you know, IPFS, IPNSD web 
ETH uh, DAT scuttlebutt protocols all registered with IANA so that it could be registered as protocol handlers inside Chromium-based browsers um, and uh, Firefox as well. Uh, and we've been working with them to do some things like uh, fixing interoperability issues with the origin security model of the web, uh, specifically around local host access. So, you know, a common pattern if you can't get inside a web browser is to run a local daemon and be able to have web content in the browser be able to communicate with that. And that's how applications run is this web front end that communicates with the local, local daemon, but not all browsers handle that situation well. Uh, we're still working on getting support, better support for local secure local host communication in WebKit, uh, but it's uh, going to be maybe a long haul there. But we work with Agalia, and they're, they're doing some work now to do the kind of prep work for Chromium support for native native uh, IPFS. The Chromium design uh, is a you know a content process that where web content runs multiple content processes. So each web page runs in its own process basically, uh, and then a kind of UI process and several other processes as well. Like a lot of network traffic uh, communication happens in its own process. So this multi-process architecture uh, is very HTTP centric. It's designed assuming basically that it's just working with HTTP. So there's a lot of work that we have to do to be able to make it so that alternative protocols can be supported. And uh, Galia is doing a lot of this work. They're working with the uh, Chromium community proposing this idea of what would the, the Chromium changes be to be able to make it easier to support multiple protocols that are not HTTP. Uh, it's going to be, it's a pretty major refactor. So, uh, but it, it's very promising that the community is pretty supportive so far of, of proposing these changes. Uh, aside from just the uh, underlying protocol implementation, the user interface and specifically the security user interface, the UX and visual design of security and trust uh, and privacy in the browser are also HTTP focused. And they assume that the origin security model of a domain name, fully qualified domain name, basically, uh, that domain name having a SSL and uh, all of that being loaded over HTTP is the nexus of that of that trust model, and that if the right pieces are in place and you can verify that that SSL certificate of the cert chain of uh, authenticators or certificate authorities, that you can trust the website. Uh, this security model of IPFS or any non-HTTP protocol and in, in the DEVA space is very very different. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done around the visual design and user experience and how we communicate what the ramifications of different protocols are in the browser. Uh, there's not really a standard. Uh, there's kind of de facto standards like here where I, I took screenshots of all of the different location bars from the diff from these five different browsers and they are uh, um, really surprisingly similar in some ways. Um, and given that there's no standard or web standard or anything like that around how we do communicate these things. These are this, the lock, for example, is a de facto standard. There's no requirement that you do that in order to be a, a browser. Uh, so there's a lot of work to develop what that security one, the security model, uh, depending on the context of, of use cases and user needs is for these protocols, uh, but also the visual design. Uh, the second major area of being on the web is actually being part of, of these organizations, these communities where decision-making happens right now, places like the W3C and IETF. Uh, and when it comes to the web platform, a lot of the decision-making is very HTTP centric. Uh, again, this means that decisions are made that maybe are not compatible with portable content uh, with content that might be shared between many to many relate people on a network uh, and assume point to point secured transports that are really different than a community or cooperative network where people are sharing data. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the crypto web three and P2P and D web projects have routed around these standards, standards bodies being like, ah, uh, W3C, they're not going to implement what I want. They only want to do HTTP stuff. Uh, they're not interested in, in, in uh, mucking about with the security model. So we're not gonna get what we need there. And let's just hope hope and gamble on a leapfrog and try not to work with them. Uh, but it's important for us, I think that there that those attitudes are not gonna change if you're not present and part of the conversation, not part of that decision-making process. If you're not raising your hand every time and saying, hey, would, would this same standard work if it was not HTTP, if, if, it, was a, if it was IPFS or if it was uh, hyper, or hypercore, or if it was secure scuttlebutt, or if, if this is on a blockchain, um, these are questions we need people in the room to be to be asking in order to be able to change that. And 
That's why it's very important that we work with friends to be able to make these changes. So Agalia is the group that we've done a lot of these changes with so far, and we've been really learning a lot too about that, that process as we work with them. You know, I came from browser world, but I didn't work directly in, in standards development every day. Um, even that, that has a bunch of peripheral uh, involvement, but Igalia has co commit uh, privileges and WebKit and Gecko and Chromium. And they're very familiar with the ins and outs and communications norms of these communities and how to get things done. So uh, we're working very closely with them, but we also want more people to be able to participate in, in this. Uh, I think it would be very interesting. There's really not a lot of the cryptocurrency world or blockchain world that present in a lot of these conversations. Uh, there might be like, you know, a blockchain initiative at one of these standards bodies or, but not in these conversations specifically around the web platform. And uh, one initiative that I'd like to do later this year is start thinking about and talking to people about what a unified block might be. What would it be like if we got the top 10 market cap cryptocurrencies together as a block and started participating in conversations at the W3C uh, representing that, that set of constituencies with their use cases, uh, with their uh, differences in security and privacy models that might be uh, better for for some people than the one size fits all security and privacy model on the on the web today. Uh, we have some tools that we use to be able to track things like change too. Like there's um, adding a, a new capability to the web is really a lot of moving pieces and a lot of different constituents and stakeholders. They all have different reasons why they're there and they have different things they want or don't want. Be able to track these uh, is, is really a lot of domain knowledge that's locked in people's heads. So this is an exercise in trying to write some of that stuff down. Like what are all the boxes you need to check to be able to know if a, if a technology is, is being adopted. But I, I think you know the, the, the ask that I have of communities like, like yours is that these spaces need more voices. Right now, there's there's not as there are really a lot of, of voices that support only default HTTP transports and protocols, and groups like yours that are developing on top of alternate protocols, uh, where you have use cases that are device to device, like the Bluetooth LE work that you're doing, and really you know messenger and and chat functionality that allows individuals to be able to communicate with each other without intermediaries. Those voices and those use cases are really really important and powerful. And if you talk to the people that are developing web standards at the W3C, the people that are writing and hammering out the spec, and it's really grueling work and and often thankless, uh, uh, they're they're desperate for input. They want more voices and they want more use cases and they want people to make clear what their needs are in developing new technologies that meet user needs um on the, and especially if it can affect the direct when it can affect the direction of the web so uh please join the w3c is can be kind of expensive but it's not too expensive for um smaller organizations and a lot of the community groups are are free and, and so a lot of the, the, the w3c has opened up more and more and more over the last decade, um, half a decade. Uh, so a lot of stuff is really easy to participate now. Uh, the, the, the second major, so that's kind of like an overview of what we're doing in the web platform and web standards, where we wanna go and kind of what the opportunities and what some of the challenges are. Um, the, the other pillars are, are really just things that we haven't leaned into as hard. The first was the be awesomely available to JS. Uh, remember the slide, right? Like this is how, sure, how do we come all 26 million, but we'd, we'd, I'd settle for 17 million. <laughs> That that'll be all right with me. So how do we embrace the needs of JavaScript developers? And this is something you know, whether you like this guy or you don't like this guy, whether you like Brave or don't like Brave, whether you enjoy JavaScript or you think JavaScript is the worst language on the planet. He said something once. He had a talk where he said, "Always bet on JS." And because JavaScript is the, long, the lingua franca of the of the web. Uh, and it distributed with every browser and also increasingly over the last decade and a half, how people are doing systems programming and server side programming and cloud programming, uh, especially with the advent of serverless models and things like this and, and, and workers at the edge, like the kind of things you're seeing from Fastly, Fastly and Cloudflare these days, uh, JavaScript is really everywhere. So embracing JavaScript as a long-term, uh, as a high priority and strategic initiative, something that I think is very important to the success of, of these types of technologies. We have JSAPFS today, uh, but it's not a full implementation. It can't participate as a full node on the network. Uh, it is limited to being a client um, and connectivity from inside the browser isn't great. Uh, connectivity on node where you actually have access to the lower, the underlying network stack that you need. Uh, 
it, those capabilities are there, but that hasn't been implemented in JavaScript. So the JavaScript support is fundamentally, you know, not functional for a lot of people's needs if they want to participate fully on the network. So that's something that is a kind of TBD. We don't we don't know yet. And there's some folks looking at and playing with like uh, some of the folks at Ceramic and Textile uh, and Fission dot codes is a these are projects that are really push deeply into what you can do with JavaScript. Um, Fission, especially inside the web space, uh, is, is really doing some interesting experiments with what you can do with non-custodial wallets in, inside web content. Um, the third one is leapfrog potential. And this is really about supporting people who are experimenting and pushing on the boundaries of, of these spaces. Uh, experimenting with what the web can be, building example browsers, Building example uh, examples of what they like web launchers would be, uh, and supporting them, and supporting them with grants, supporting them with investment, supporting them uh, in our social networks and things like that. Uh, Agrigore is one that they uh, Move did a talk at the beginning of the browser 3000 uh, hackathon where they have a browser that supports IPFS and DAT and HTTP and uh, I forget maybe I2P was the third one, fourth one. Uh, but the idea of a multi-protocol browser, what would that look like? Um, and so very interesting experiment. Frame is a, started out as an Ethereum wallet, but it's an OS level wallet, not like MetaMask where it runs in the browser. Uh, it runs at the operating system level and they're doing some interesting experiments using uh, web applications that are loaded via IPFS and then using Frame as a launcher for dApps in that way, which is a really interesting twist on what a, what a browser is uh, and, and, and a more application-oriented one that I'm very interested in, in supporting. Puma browser, I've known Yuri for quite some time, and Puma is a mobile app that supports uh, Coil's web monetization API. Uh, they're doing some interesting things on mobile and you know one of the perspective slides that I did not write yet is about the difference between mobile and desktop markets. So it's very important that the, if we want these technologies to work, as you very well know at Birdie, because you're mobile first, is that it has to be mobile. So it's very interested in what Puma is doing as a browser. And then Mask is uh, some folks that were, I, I know from the IPFS camp, they were also there, part of the matters.news project. And Mask has been doing some things where they're adding you know, crypto capabilities to things like Twitter through web extensions. So you can actually send crypto or send encrypted messages through Twitter itself using the web extension to be able to augment and hack Twitter. Uh, but they're looking at building out uh, browsers as well that support these functions because again, Manifest V3 is taking a lot of capabilities away from the web extension space. So they're having to think about what, what would it mean to actually build a, a browser that's, that can do these things uh, that, that people could, could install. And there's more, but some of, these, some of these projects are not as ready to share publicly yet, but I think we're gonna see an explosion of, uh, of new different types of browsers or browser-like products and applications coming. I did a talk at the D-Web camp two years ago about the, the rise of the super browser, maybe the, the age of the one size fits all browser of tabs inside windows is maybe that's done. Maybe we are nearing the end of that. And I think uh, with a combination of that, that, that UX metaphor not meeting our needs generally from an information overload standpoint, uh, but also the capability set of today's browsers not meeting our needs from a uh, safety, security, and how we interact with our fellow humans online, perspective that we are going to see maybe a Cambrian explosion of new and different types of browser or browser-like things, which is pretty exciting. Uh, but with all these efforts, doesn't mean that it's all done. IPFS itself is not done. And there's a lot of things that we need to still figure out. Uh, some of these are table stakes for competing in a world that's HTTP centric, where it, HTTP has a privacy model. It's between you and that server. Um, of course, they pull in third-party scripts and surveillance capitalism, so that's pretty much gone immediately out of gate. Uh, but having an idea of what that model is is really important. Having an application model and what Frame is doing for DApps is is going to be something that will allow that space to accelerate faster. Um, you can put a lot of stuff on IPFS today, but you have a desktop node, and then your web app has a node, and the extension has a node, and then you've got some stuff on this other IPFS server. Where's your stuff? There's not really a way to track what is yours and where it is uh, yet, which is difficult, makes things difficult. Uh, and then even how to search or even index that data. And then right now the IPFS network is public by default. Uh, anyone who joins the network can see what other people are requesting, what they're serving, what the uh, contents are. Uh, if you encrypt it, they can even see what you're doing. So basically get metadata for free in that world, even if you're encrypting the data before you put it on the network, you can see who's talking to who. So it's a very, there's really, really a lot of stuff to figure out. 
uh, we are we do have a grants program. So if you are interested in building out some of these ideas and experimenting with the web and what the web might be, uh, we're look always looking for interesting projects that we would like that we can fund from grants. And then we also have accelerators that we work with that are interested in funding companies that are doing this kind of work as well. Uh, and that's the whirlwind tour in just about 40 minutes of the work that we're doing to build IPFS into browsers. How do we change, augment, and add it to the web platform? A little background on how to change the web platform itself, the biggest ship that there is, uh, and some of the opportunities and some of the people that are pushing on these problems today. So thanks a lot for listening and having me for the Birdie Builders Meetup. Thanks, Dietrich. Thanks. Was Thank really you. Good. Happy to answer any questions as well. So yeah, if you have any question, uh, you can ask them in the Meetup chat text channel. So I already asked uh, a question. Uh, what features could be missing in the current web browsers APIs to improve the JS version of IPFS? Yeah, so it, it's an interesting question because uh, I, I, I would rather answer that by maybe zooming out a little bit and saying, well, are you, do you want to run an HTTP web app or do you want to run a IPFS served web app? Uh, I, I don't think we've really answered that question. Like an HTTP based web app IPFS running inside of it may be nice, but it also doesn't get you a lot of the benefits of IPFS because a government can turn off DNS or a government could turn off the internet still. Um, so if there's not an IPFS daemon available, a lot of the benefits of IPFS go away when you're running J IPF JS IPFS inside an HTTP security context and a, a, I guess, top level navigation is pretty much what we call it inside of a browser. Um, now, assuming that you're okay with that and you want to load a web app within an HTTP top level oh, navigation, um, then there are features that, that would make things much, much better. Like right now, there's no way for us to do realistically like bi-directional bi -directional streaming inside browsers. Um, the streams APIs are not well implemented uh, or interoperable across browsers. There's still big pieces that are not implemented. Um, the local host APIs, a WebKit, are a real blocker for us being able to communicate with local IPFS daemons. So there's like a long list of stuff. If you go to the IPFS and web browsers repo on GitHub, there's like a, la a laundry list of things that we would love to add. I think in a dream world too, like I worked on a project, um, me and a friend worked on a side project at Mozilla before I left Mozilla called libdweb. What libdweb did um, is it added extension APIs that would allow you to have an, a, a true IPFS node inside the browser. So I think if you were you know, asking for a true wish list, I think some of those APIs too would be really good to have. Um, but you know, even, even with the current browser world we have today, even a few tweaks would, would probably really help. Uh, the next question we have from Holmes Worcester is how many people at Protocol Labs or contractors are participating in the work you describe on standards at W3C, what working group and IETF? Uh, right now, not a lot. There's, hey Holmes, there's um, myself and I'm only working on it part-time right now as well. I'm definitely not able to dedicate full-time. I've been in, uh, embroiled in the hackathonathon project, which is always be hackathoning, being in a hackathon all the time. Uh, and that's really exciting, but also really exhausting. There's not a lot of time. So I don't get as much time to spend on this as I would like. Uh, my friend Lytle, who implemented IPFS Companion and, and is the maintainer of that, does some work in this area as well. And then we work with Agalia and we basically have a contract with Agalia where they have uh, you know, one or more people working on some of these issues full time. Because with web standards, some of these issues might like make a comment on the WebKit issue about local host uh, secure transport. Uh, Chrome has implemented it, Firefox has implemented it, and that took a lot of work to be able to get that you know, set up and interoperable and, and compatible. But now we're still blocked on WebKit doing it. So you might ask a question and then three months later, one of the WebKit engineers might answer and be like, no, for these reasons. And you are like, well, here's other reasons. The other browsers have already done it. And then you wait three more months and then WebKit get back, you know, like it's not uh, moving these balls forward on the web platform can take a really, really long time. Um, so we, we have that group as well. And then I'm interested too in, in folks that are that want to participate. Like we have some initiatives uh, like getting multi-codec and multi-base uh, and some of these other 
in a core primitives of the IPFS stack into IT, ITF recommended standards, so recommend recommendations. So if you're interested in doing some work in this space, please reach out as well, because uh, we're really happy to do a contract or a grant for more people who want to participate. Uh, how was Web3 Weekend and what were the best projects to hack the Web3 Weekend was awesome. Uh, it was it was challenging because it was very short. It was like the 36 hours of hacking, I think. Um, that one was really cool though. And there's way more projects than we ever thought. Um, I'm not a smart contracts expert. So I learn a lot during these during these projects. And I think, I think it was that one where the number one project that we gave was a, a project that used live streaming video over IPFS and uh, NFTs for access and payment and smart contract login to be able to manage that payment. And it kind of put all those Lego pieces together in a way that made a, you know, dis fully distributed, fully decentralized live video streaming application all put together in a very, very nice user experience. It was very cool. Uh, maybe a question for Birdie, but what kinds of IPFS integration on the web are necessary for Birdie to work well on the web? That definitely is a question for Birdie. I'm not sure what their plans are for, for that. Anybody want to comment? Um, uh, it's a bit complicated. Uh, the main problem for us is all our code base is, uh, is uh, in Go uh, as of today. So it will be a lot of work to to uh, port everything in JS. Uh, plus, we couldn't have um, access to the OS API to do stuff like uh, multiplayer connectivity or Bluetooth uh, using uh, using a web browser API, I think. So, yeah, right now it's not, our main concern is to to port everything and uh, and uh, get access to the right uh, API in the system. But we we thought about like a kind of workaround that could be to have like, um, I don't know, a temporary node accessible uh, on the web and uh, you, you on servers and you can connect to it uh, using a web browser. But uh, we, we don't know yet if we will do that just like uh, an ID for now. Love it. Uh, I'm, one of the things that I encourage a lot of the people and the teams and the projects that I work with in this space is to, you know, a lot of people are rushing forward experimenting. Like Birdie has rushed, they've built an application. It's an incredibly beautiful application. Uh, it implements some of the things I've always wanted in a, you know, in a chat application that I can't have today. Uh, but what is the learning from that? What is the application pattern? the application model? How do you extrapolate that model or that pattern? What are the pieces, the ingredients that you use that allowed you to unlock that pattern? How can other people replicate that pattern? And ultimately, how do you make things that are interoperable? If I want to message somebody who is not using Birdie and I want to use Birdie, how is there a way, is there an interoperability standard? Probably too early for where Birdie is on the life cycle, but when you're looking two, three, five, ten 10 years down the road, and how to get to 26 million developers or a billion users, you start needing to think about, you either need to be as big as Google and be centralized, but if you're not gonna be centralized, how do you make it so a billion clients can bloom? And typically that's through um, standardized, interoperable, compatible APIs. So that, that is something that I definitely would encourage looking at that, that type of growth. Um, uh, Question from Manfred, how do you imagine mixing the Web3 vision, keep your stuff with you with the cyber cafe approach of using somebody else's computer as a guest? Uh, that's, that's a really good question. I think that one thing that's interesting to me is the ability to have custom cryptographic primitives available to you at the application level in browsers. And that's what I think things like MetaMask is doing when they provide a wallet API to web content. Uh, that's a way for you to be able to get private communication through ways that are not built into the browser necessarily. The underlying pieces are though, and you can build on top of those. I think we're just seeing now the beginnings of people doing that type of experimentation. And I think that we're gonna see more and more and more of it. And once you have those types of tools available to you, then you have the ability to have more secure communication. I think Agoric is also doing interesting work around uh, secure JavaScript, where you can have more, uh, a, a more more assurances that the the 
code that's running in, in specific sandboxes is not available to other applications or the other safe at the operating system level. I think we'll, we'll there's some uh, hardware stuff as as well that I think we'll probably have a dependency on. If you can't trust the underlying hardware all the way down the stack, then it's really hard to have that type of use somebody else's computer level of, of trust, let alone even use yours in some threat models. Uh, another question from Manfred, do you know about initiatives about decentralized identity that don't rely on blockchain and don't need any consensus block writing style action to register? Uh, there actually was one that did a talk at IPFS meetup earlier this year called Human Node. Human Node has no blockchain and uh, operates this way. This way. Fission.codes is another one that does not have a blockchain part of their authentication and identity story. So there's a couple that you could that I recommend looking at. The, the fission.codes folks are, are great doing some, like I said, some really interesting work too in pushing the boundaries of what's possible on the web. Uh, their, their approach and philosophy is no extension required and just have it work in the regular web today, which is an uh, incredibly difficult constraint to put on yourself, but has resulted in some fantastic innovation uh, in their web native file system that they're building on top of IPFS. Uh, any any other questions? Do you think the W3C could or should be replaced by an alliance of the big players in the crypto world, decentralized ecosystem projects in the form of a DAO, for example, to cooperate and build new standards in the coming years? I, I don't know if, I don't know, yeah, could, could or should are, are interesting words. Um, you know, like there's no way to know what, what would happen. I'm very interested in trying something like that out, uh, I, whether it's an alliance or just even getting more people involved, right? Like, you know, you're saying big players in crypto, but my ask was, you know, what what about what about Birdie participating in the future of the web, right? What about the, the voices of all of these different projects? I do uh, like the idea of eating our own dog food and using something like a DAO to be able to manage uh, alliances like that, right? Um, what would it mean to to stake uh, something against a ability to vote? Um, but then, you know, there's, there's trade-offs in those approaches. Right now, you could participate in the conversation about an identity or a privacy API, the W3C, and without having to do anything like that, which is also kind of kind of nice as well. Um, so I think there's trade-offs. I do think generally more participation more voices is 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 really important if if we want to see those spaces change and if we want to see um, the the decision making in those spaces affected by our needs and I think without any presence from DWeb crypto P two P projects then you're not going to see the outcomes that you would like to see that space without us participating in it will be infinitely disappointing and be only HTTP centric. And, and won't result in the changes that we want that we want to see. Any other questions while we're here? Ooh. If not, oh, there's people typing. I can see it. Yeah, I think that's the one. Human node. Yes. They have some some biometrics in there somehow. Um, and I think you can do it without the biometrics too. It's one of the questions from the last time they came and spoke at one of our meetups. <laughs> Any other questions before we roll out today? And I can let you all go to sleep because it's what, 11 o'clock? friends right now. Oh, no, wait, I forgot. I'm on East Coast. So, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. Yatrish, we have a, like a, a ritual here. Can you name like a book, uh, a song, and a person we should interview? Ooh. Uh, yes. Uh, the, I will try. Uh, before I do that, though, I'm going to ask this question here. How worried are you about the closing down of macOS and already closed iOS? Increasing iOS privacy concerns was the game plan, the big game plan for iPhones. Yeah, uh, uh, always, always worried. <laughs> sweat drip, sweat drip. Um, there's, yeah, it's, you know, the, 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 our lack of ability. I, I guess, so from one perspective, I think working on a product that had hundreds of millions of users for many years gave me an understanding in the decision-making process that very large companies make when they say, I'm doing this for your safety. Um, you definitely, 
as people that work in an area that we want cryptographic verifiability in our software operations and how our software executes. We want to be able to trust it in that way. We understand that downloading dangerous code and executing it locally is an incredibly dangerous thing to do. And you easily can give up the keys to the kingdom. Um, so I understand where App Apple is coming from in closing that. Uh, I am also glad that we have alternative choices uh, for desktop and mobile operating systems. Mobile is a whole different problem space for sure. But when you say big game plan for iPhones, you know, the, ultimately uh, App Apple has all the decision-making power there. If you choose the iPhone as your environment, then you are seeding the control over your operating environment to that company that one single company. And so there, I mean, there's, there's ambient pressure, like, you know, with the, what we're doing with WebKit, right? It's like keeping up the conversation, being present, being part of that conversation. But outside of that, functionally, there's nothing we can do besides soft power, being able to hopefully create an environment where these larger organizations are forced into making decisions if they're not gonna really do it themselves. Um, but uh, ultimately, the, the, you, you know, you're choosing a platform that where the choices are, are made for you. Uh, and that's uh, unfortunate. And that's definitely a, a harsh reality of the world. And if you look at the PWA feature story over the last half a decade, right? Like it's not almost non-existent. It's still a nightmareville. And Apple is holding, as the recent post said, Apple's holding the web hostage and holding it back. Um, so not just in PWAs, but all kinds of other web platform features where they are not compatible with other web rendering engines. Uh, so one of the, while the web is the biggest ship uh, and has the biggest surface area for innovation and for people to have choice. It's also, you know, one of the most complicated landscapes. Um, that diversity of stakeholders make it so it's a shifting landscape, and that makes it difficult. Um, I've heard how much being able to use IPFS between the Earth and Mars, or best way to communicate between Earth and Mars, including the roadmap mission PL. Uh, you know what's rad about this, Manfred, is that you know we're actually talking to, and I can't. Uh, be totally and uh, sadly and share all the details, but you know we're talking to some folks in the space industry, and one of the coolest parts about these conversations is that space was integrated into the design of IPFS. There's not really a lot of new stuff we have to do. We have to figure out stuff like maybe performance over low latency connections and things like that. But everybody has to figure that out. HTTP sucks at that. It's not like there's some kind of special special thing there. But what's great is that the local first and uh, like uh, offline functional and disconnected network functional, uh, local network functional nature of IPFS being transport agnostic really means that developing applications for space communication ends up being simpler at the application layer, more complicated in the underlying guts where you have to deal with different new or proprietary protocols that exist on space hardware. Um, but the design of the protocol itself really took those considerations into, in, into, the, into, into the how it was designed originally. So that's actually been pretty neat to see. And I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Uh, from Zuma, what's the most important use case or product of IPFS currently in terms of metrics? NFT should be bigger and bigger with OpenC. I think, yeah, I think NFT is for sure blew up our world, at least on the IPFS team uh, earlier this year when, when that explosion happened. We're seeing uh, not only you know NFT use cases explode, like so volumes increasing, use cases are exploding, being used this primitive as a primitive for all types of things, not just digital art. And uh, we're also seeing more and more people coming to the coming to the space. So it used to be like, you know, you got some developers who are like, hey, I know how to develop stuff, but how does IPFS work? With NFTs, now we're just seeing people, I'm learning to code. How does IPFS work? And it's their first time in being using technology and building things with technology. And NFT has opened up an entire market area of market uh, for people to experiment and grow and build new products and, and companies and things like that. So it's very interesting. The uh, overall excitement that creators have, especially um, you know non-technical artistic people, they the level of excitement is just super inspiring to see. Uh, some other comments. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I don't, that, that's not the space people work that, that I was talking about. But I think I did see that, it's pretty funny. Any other questions today? Okay. Um, speaker. 
uh, if there's one book that I probably recommended more than any other book uh, in, the, in the last decade to people, uh, it's a book by Evan Osnos uh, called Age of Ambition. And it's about China during the 2000s. Uh, and it's, it's many stories of different people in China and gives you a view into both uh, censorship that happens there and kind of like the mechanics of, of how it happens, how it affects people in different business layers. Um, there's this fascinating section about kind of the rise of blogging in late 2000s, like uh, even after the blogging was a start to not as be much a thing in the US. But more than anything, it's the most populated, um, most populated country in the planet with a huge influence on technology a huge influence geopolitically, and we're going to see more and more of it. Uh, if you're not paying attention to what's happening in technology in China, then you, you know, you're know you really missing out on a view into overall technology around the world, trends and, and, and threats and opportunities that, that we're all going to see. So uh, for me, it's just a great con book for gaining some context. And I've spent, I've lived in, in Asia twice uh, once for a year in 2010, 11, and once for a year in 2017. Uh, and went to many, many countries there. And it's definitely, you know, I think for me, this is a book that helps give a lot of context to what happens in China. Um, especially, you know, a lot of people make vague generalizations about how censorship works or how deep it is. And this book really gives you a, a, a sense of how it affects people at all these different strata of society in, in China. So it's a, it's a, it's also a really fun read. It's endlessly fascinating, the kind of book that you can't put down. Um, a song, there's a, there's a, a, I don't, uh, there's a song that's been stuck in my head for days and I can't get it out. And it's not a song that I really particularly like. So I'm not gonna say that song. Um, uh, let me think of another song for a speaker hmm, for the Birdie Builders community. Who would be a good speaker? I, I would recommend actually just have the whole fission.codes team come and speak. Um, the, you know, Boris is one of the people who founded it. Uh, and it's actually one of the reasons why I ended up at Protocol Labs and IPFS, uh, because another person who recently joined them is also from Mozilla, is, uh, was a product, the lead product manager for Firefox for, for several years. Um, and there, uh, and then this, um, Brooke, who's on their team, has implemented and designed a lot of the, uh, you know, the cryptography and the security model and um, designed and implemented a lot of that. And I think we're going to see very, very interesting things from the uh, innovation that they're doing inside web content. I'd like to see a lot of these patterns uh, escape web content, but they would be an interesting group to speak to as well. If there was a PL person, um, I think it would be for this particular community, my recommendation from PL people would be to bring in Jimmy Lee. Uh, he is part of the applications research group at Protocol Labs and he developed slate.host, uh, him, him and a group of people, uh, a team of people, estuary.tech, file.app. Um, and he's just a fantastic person, very creative, a world-class designer that is also able to nimbly uh, w play with the IPFS and Filecoin stack. Uh, so, so definitely having him come speak, uh, I think would be great, especially, you know, given uh, the end user focus of Purdy's product of the, of the bubble application. In a song. You know, I've, I've got like a whole directory of like Diplo live sets and I'll just put those on and they, you know, it's like 17, 18 hours of music. It's not a song. It's more like 20,000 songs, but maybe that's a reflection of how I listen to music. I did have, um, even because there are a lot of French people here, I did have uh, Serge Gainsbourg's r dub reggae album playing in the car. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Cool, cool. Thank you very much for, for this talk. Uh, it, it was really interesting, uh, really inspiring for, for us at Bertie. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, thank, you. Me. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you to everyone uh, that was here. And uh, yeah, see you next time uh, for the next uh, Windows meeting. <laughs>